I've searched many years on end. There was none that my soul could depend. My soul cries out. For your presence in here, this very hour. For your presence in here, in His name I find, in His name I find, in His name I find. Welcome to the Somerset Presbyterian Church in this fourth Sunday of Lent. Please check out our announcements and the prayer list in the bulletin and on the SBC website. But first, let's have a word from Tom. Thank you, James. Just wanted to let people know uh, that we're part of a new presbytery now. It's called the Highlands Presbytery. Uh, the seven presbyteries that we had in, in New Jersey uh, were combined into four new presbyteries. Uh, for a time it was called the Northwest Presbytery, uh, but it's been renamed the Highlands Presbytery. So that's our new presbytery that the Somerset Presbyterian Church is part of. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Now, let's worship God.
Will you pray with me? Prayer of the day. God of light and love, shine upon your people this day. Meet us in our brokenness and heal our errant ways. Take from us our spirit of disobedience and save us with your grace. Lead us into your truth that we may live as children of the light and act as children of the Most High. Amen. All who are able, please stand. Let's join together in our call to worship. Give thanks and sing of mercy and grace. We, we sing of God's amazing love. love. Rejoice and offer praise for Christ, uh, for Christ is here. We worship one who lives. Walk in the light. Live in this love. Redeemed and reclaimed. We, we live in the spirit of love. love. Let's listen to God's word in song. M285. Scripture reminds us that we still sin. We need to confess our failures, knowing that the Lord Jesus intercedes with us, for us with the Father, who freely forgives us through his infinite goodness and mercy. So let us draw near to God with sincerity and confidence and pray together. Please join me in, the prayer of con in our unison prayer of confession. God of poisonous snakes and deadly crosses, your ways can be terrible to behold when we complain about what we lack rather than celebrating our sustaining gifts. Forgive us when we see only the bad in our lives and fail to see the good, heal our vision, when we act as disobedient children and turn away from your life. Save us with your unfailing grace. In Christ's name we pray. Please join me in a moment of silent reflection. God did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but rather that we might know salvation and grace through Christ. Behold the steadfast love that endures forever. In this love we are forgiven and redeemed by God. Please stand and join me in reciting praises to God for the gift of grace. Gloria Patri. Glory, Glory be to the, the Father, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, Ghost, as it was in the beginning, it's now, and now, now and never shall be, world without end. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. God has gathered us here in this place. In thanksgiving for all that he's done, uh, God has done, let us greet each other with signs of peace of the peace of Christ 
to a parade wave. Will you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, your word beckons us. Your spirit empowers us. May we hear and receive this day all that you share with us. So our first scripture reading comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Now at this point, the Israelites have been wandering the desert for quite some time. And our scripture reading is about the bronze serpent. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. And they spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. And the people came to Moses and said, We've sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole, and anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. And then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our second scripture reading comes from the book of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. This is when Nicodemus comes to visit Jesus. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they, not, they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their evil deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. The Gospel of the Lord. So I was looking for an introduction for today's sermon and came across a pertinent cartoon. Three people are holding Bibles and whining at the person at the end of the table where there looks to be a tabletop pulpit. And the first person whines, why study the book of Numbers? And the second person whines, 36 chapters of self-centered people who whine every time they don't get their own way. And the third person whines, give us something relevant. And the cartoon depicts three whiny people who are not unlike the Israelites in the very Bible book they're complaining about. So Numbers and Exodus records the Israelite story from their enslavement in Egypt and their subsequent liberation by God until they reach and claim the promised land. Throughout this time frame, the Israelites were constantly complaining and grumbling. And one commentary tells us, seven times in six verses in Numbers, some form of the word murmur appears. It is derived from an ancient word that describes a sound people make when they complain, a constant, low, rumbling, like you would hear if you put a conch shell to your ear or endured sleepless night. And the online dictionary defines murmuring as a subdued or private expression of discontent or dissatisfaction. And anyone who has ever raised children has been subject to murmuring or what we call whining 
and knows how annoying it can be. I personally can attest to that with my own kids at some times or another when they were little. And the Israelites were like little children when faced with a negative situation, they whined and complained, and it showed their lack of maturity, both emotionally and spiritually. The Israelites wanted to be free, but they didn't want to do the hard work that came with getting that freedom and keeping it. They wanted the reward, but they didn't want the responsibilities or the hardships that they would endure and that come with trying to get your freedom. Consequently, it was easier to whine, complain, and blame someone else when things didn't go the way that they wanted it. And this was probably a bad habit that they picked up in Egypt when they were slaves. During their enslavement, they didn't have any power to run their own lives. Therefore, the only thing that they could do was to grumble. And an article in Psychology Today tells us that grumbling is an immature way of trying to get attention sympathy, something material, or just getting your own way with the hope of wearing someone else down. And we can see this strategy employed throughout Numbers and Exodus. First they grumbled about things, and then they grumbled about their leaders, and then finally in this passage they were grumbling about God. And by the time we get to our passage today, God had had enough of their relentless grumbling and again, if you've had children, you know how annoying that can be after a while. And while God's solution to the problem on our story seems very harsh, there's more going on here than meets the eye. This passage points to a larger picture. It's kind of a parable for what's going to be going on in the future. And in our passage today, Moses lifted up the brass serpent in the wilderness to heal the people from the snake bites which was a punishment for their grumbling. And those who look at the serpent on the cross were healed. And in our other passage today, Jesus refers to the passage from, um, from Numbers about the lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, and then goes on to explain that the Son of Man must be lifted up in the same way so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. So earlier in my faith journey, I didn't quite get the connection, no matter how many times I read these passages. And what I eventually learned, that the, what the Numbers passage meant was, when Moses lifted the serpent up on a pole, it was a vertical pole like this, and another pole on top of it like this, and it looked like a capital letter T, and the serpent was up on the top. What I didn't get was, contrary to popular opinion, the cross that Jesus is, was on was not the typical type of cross that we use today. What they, the Romans did was they had a pole this way and a pole this way that looked very similar to a capital letter T. So that's where the connection comes in, and that helped me to see it a little bit better. So the cross the serpent was on was to bring healing to all people who looked toward it. And similarly, Jesus dying on the cross for our sins brings healing to the souls of all who believe and look upon the cross. In other words, through faith in God's Son, those who believe will be healed of their sinful nature. And in both instances, the cross, the capital letter T, healed those who trusted in God. Yet trust in God is a hard commodity to come by for us humans as seen in the examples of the Israelites. And if you search yourself, you probably will find times when, even though God has done wonderful things for you, you still have that trouble trusting uh, from time to time. And so God provided for the Israelites in many miraculous ways, yet time and time again, they showed their lack of faith and trust in God. And instead of being grateful, the Israelites were never satisfied with God's provisions. They were certainly, they were always constantly grumbling about something. First they grumbled when they were enslaved and God frees them. Then they grumbled as they left Egypt when they were trapped along the Red Sea. And then God miraculously parts the Red Sea so they can get through safely to the other side. Yet, they were still grumbling even after that. They continued to grumble for their lack of water, their lack of food, 
And then later, when even when God opened up water and brought water, to, opened up the stone and brought water to them, and sent manna from heaven to feed them, and then pigeons to feed them, they still grumbled. They grumbled about the lack of variety, and they grumbled against their leaders several times throughout Numbers and Exodus as well as grumbled against the Lord because they were barred from entering the promised land because they didn't trust in God's provision to win the battle for the promised land the first time they, they came upon the promised land. And if the Israelites, God's chosen people, are having trouble not grumbling, then how do we combat this issue in our own lives? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 tells us to rejoice always and to be thankful regardless of circumstances because this is God's will for all believers. From this passage we can see that complaining and grumbling is a direct opposite of gratitude. Margaret Shriver in her article Is Grumbling a Sin tells us, and I'm going to read it to you, gratitude leads to deep contentment and peace, brings assurance that God is with us, working for the good of those who love him. Grumbling can turn you into a negative person who looks inward instead of being focused on the goodness of God. God hates grumbling as he hates all sin. It can have far-reaching effects. As a habit, it affects our attitude to life and our attitude to Jesus, because it usually is linked to criticism, which can give the devil a foothold. Footholds develop into strongholds, if they are not recognized and dealt with. Grumbling infects the attitudes of others because you don't usually grumble to yourself. It can be a means of spreading discontent, especially when it's against God's appointed leaders. And the longer you grumble about a situation, a person, circumstances, co-workers, the church, or your family, the more justified you can feel in doing so. A lack of gratitude leads to dissatisfaction with what we have, which then leads to envy, resentment, and bitterness, which in turn leads to sinful behavior. And it all started with just one small unhealthy thought. Remember, the Apostle Paul tells us to take all rebellious thoughts captive and to obey Christ, and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And he tells us this for good reason. A stray thought can lead us down a wrong path. And I'm going to read you a story that illustrates this point. It's entitled, The Hospital Room. There were two men, both seriously ill, who occupied the same hospital room. And although it was difficult for him, one of the men was able to sit up in his bed for an hour a day to drain the fluid from his lungs. His bed was next to the room's only window. And the other man had to spend all his time flat on his back. And these men talked for hours on end. They spoke of their wives and their families, their homes and their jobs, their involvement in the military service, and even where they spent their vacations. And every afternoon when the man was in the bed next to the window could struggle to sit up, he would pass the time by describing to his roommate all the things that he could see outside that one lonely window. How the man in the other bed would live for those moments, for that one hour period, where his world would be broadened and enlivened by all the activity and color of the outside world. Now the window overlooked a park with a lovely lake the man described. Ducks and swans played in the shimmering water while the children sailed their model boats. Lovers walked arm in arm amid the blooming flowers of every color of the rainbow. And grand old trees graced the landscape, and a fine view of the city skyline could be seen in the distance. And as the man by the window described this all in exquisite detail, the man on the other side of the room would close his eyes and imagine the picturesque scene. One warm, warm afternoon, the other man could not hear the band, but was, uh, the other man just was describing a parade that was going by. He could see it in his mind's eye, although, as the other person did describe it. And he described it in vivid detail and descriptive words. 
Unexpectedly, though, an alien thought entered his head. Why should he have all the pleasure of seeing everything while I never get to see anything, he thought to himself. It didn't seem fair. As this thinking fermented, the man felt ashamed at first. But as the days passed, he missed seeing more sights, and his envy eroded into resentment, and it soon turned him sour. He began to brood and found himself unable to sleep. He should be by that window, he thought, and this unrelenting notion controlled his life. He could not stop thinking about it. Late one night, as he lay staring at the ceiling, thinking of mean and evil thoughts about the fact that he had no window to enjoy, the sick man by the window began to cough. He was choking on the fluid in his own lungs. And the other man watched in the dimly lit room as a struggling man by the window groped for the button to call for help. Listening to the futile efforts being made, the man across the room never moved, never pushed his own button that would have brought the nurse running. In less than five minutes, the coughing and choking stopped, along with the sound of breathing. Now there was only silence, deathly silence. The following morning, the day nurse arrived to bring water for their baths. And when she found the lifeless body of the man by the window, she was saddened and called the attendant to take the lifeless body away. No words and no fuss. And as soon as it seemed appropriate, the man asked if he could be moved next to the window. And the nurse was happy to make the switch. After making sure he was comfortable, she left him alone. Slowly, painfully, he propped himself up on one elbow to take his first look. Finally, finally he would have the joy of seeing it all for himself. And he was overjoyed for that now he could see the park, the parades, and all the activity that was described to him by his dead roommate. He strained to sit up, and after much effort, he slowly turned to look out the window beside the bed. And to his horror, the window was surrounded by a blank cement wall. The man was beside himself with shock. He pressed the button to call the nurse, and agitated, he asked, what could have compelled my deceased roommate to describe such detail and wonderful things outside this window? There's nothing to see. Where are all the wonderful things he saw? Is this new and a recent wall? And why did he give me such vivid details that didn't exist? And the nurse shook her head sadly and answered his question with a shake of her head. Perhaps he just wanted to encourage you and make you happy. You see, your roommate was totally blind. And as we contemplate this story, let us all remember how easy a stray thought can take hold and poison our attitude and perception of things. Grumbling to ourselves and others due to envious thoughts is a slippery slope. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul gives us a warning from Israel's history when he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Let us all learn a lesson from the Israelites and the man in the bed away from the window. Complaining, whether done outwardly or inwardly, is not only unhelpful, but leads to sinful behavior. Friends, the way to combat murmuring, complaining, and grumbling is to stop it right in its track from the start. Do not give it a foothold by taking any discontented thought captive. But the best way of think keeping these thoughts away is to develop a heart of gratitude. 
When we are grateful for what we have, we're not even looking for more. We are free to enjoy the moment because we trust in God's provision. Consequently, we are granted God's peace, a peace free from worrying and grumbling. Let us also learn a lesson from the blind man in the hospital bed next to the window. As we bask in God's steadfast love and never-ending grace, we learn to be content with what we have, and we are free to share it with others, the gift of hope and joy that God has bestowed upon us. So whether we live a life with discontent in our hearts, manifesting itself through our grumblings, or live with gratitude in our hearts, manifesting through overflowing love and joy, is, it is up to us. The choice is ours. And may we all choose wisely. Amen. Let us listen to God's word in song. Hymn number 391, Take My Life, verses 1, 5, and 6. implores us to offer thanksgiving sacrifices. May the gifts we offer today be symbols of our gratitude for God's love and blessings. Therefore, there are three ways that you can send in your offering. You can send it in through the regular mail or drop it off at the church. You can make a donation through our website and by PayPal. Or you can place it in the offering plate in the narthex on your way out. Please stand and join me in reciting the doxology, hymn number 592. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God, of, let us pray our a prayer of dedication. God of steadfast love and never-ending grace, Thank you for the gifts of eternity entrusted to us. Gifts of love and grace that others may know hope and joy. Bless these gifts we return to you this coming week and now, that they may be a taste of eternity and a promise of a new life through the ministries of this church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now it's time for the prayers of the people. Will you pray with me again? Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray and promised that what we asked in his name will be given to us. Guide us by your Holy Spirit, that our prayers for others may serve your will and show your steadfast love. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. God of heaven and earth, you called us in humility before you, bringing the offering of our very selves as you revealed Jesus to be your son in his baptism at the hand of John. So you claimed our lives in baptism that we may die to sin and be raised with him in new life. 
by your Spirit, confirm in our hearts the witness that Christ is Savior of the world and our Lord. Accept all that we have and are, O God, in the service of Jesus Christ, and strengthen us with your Spirit's power, now and forever. Let us pray for the world. Creator God, you made all things in your wisdom, and in your love you save us. We pray for the whole creation. Order unruly powers, deal with injustice, feed and satisfy those who thirst for justice, so that your children may freely enjoy the earth you have made, and cheerfully sing your praises. Gracious God, you have called us to be the Church of Jesus Christ. Keep us one in faith and service, breaking bread together and telling the good news to the world, that all may believe you are love. Turn to your ways and live to your glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray for the sick. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world. Look with compassion on all who are sick. We especially lift up today Cheryl and James, George and Jerry, Pat and Ariel, Cindy, Arlene, Connie, Judith, Kirk, Lee, Yvonne, Mitch, Julia, Van, Jeanette, Charles and his wife, Cecile, Bill, Mary Jane, Mujiba, Barbara, Todd. Cheer them by your word and bring healing as a sign of your grace. God of comfort, stand with those who sorrow. We especially lift up today the family of Craig, the family of Harriet, and the family of Karen. May they know that men they may they be sure that neither death nor life nor things to come shall separate them from your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, you have stretched out your arms of love on the hardwood of the cross that everyone might come within reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge of love of you for the honor of your name. And may we all pray the prayer that our Lord taught us printed in the bulletin. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us listen now to God's word and song, hymn number 343, called as partners in Christ's service, verses 1, 3, and 4, printed in your bulletin.
brothers and sisters, walk in the light of Christ, leaving your brokenness, mistrust, and disobedience behind, and rest in God's compassion and grace. Go in from this place knowing that you are loved and forgiven. Go with the blessings of Almighty God, abiding in Christ's tender care, trusting for God's provision for your life. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Hallelujah In the presence of my 